space calibration complete. What's up, men and nerds? Let's break down Luther, <coughs> Luthen's ship. That's a callback to last episode. And at this time, we don't know the ship's name, but there's a ton of things we can deduce about everybody's favorite new ship. This is a Fondor Hallcraft. Fondor was a planet in the colonies region that had been a highly advanced sort of lesser Coruscant, with cities and manufacturing covering up most of the surface, way back since the time of the Old Republic, and was still booming into the Imperial era. Their main industry was starship construction, and though it mostly focused on civilian craft, by 19 BBY onward, it was securing a lot of Imperial contracts, forming the triad of shipyards that fueled the Empire, being Kuat, Fondor, and Scarif. Dozens of these massive shipyards both on-world and in orbit. What's going to be a reoccurring theme in this video is how this ship points to the real genius of Luthen. Being one of the most prominent starship producers in history, it gave him one of the best ways to blend in and fade into the crowd of ships. On Earth, this concept is a sleeper car, something that looks unassuming but can outperform flashy, purpose-made supercars. Luthen wanted something like this old farm truck here. The greatest ally to any criminal or rebel during Imperial reign was the arrogance and security that imps felt. Whether it be armed and armored stormtroopers pushing around starving peasants, or multi-million dollar technical marvels with thousands of imps on board stopping some small shipping craft, most Imperials internalized the Tarkin Doctrine that just by being with such a massive, overwhelming force, the citizens would be kept in place by fear. So instead of flying around in some sleek ship like Darth Maul's Infiltrator, or some flashy Nubian design, the Hallcraft appeals to Imperial overconfidence. And since Fondor did pick up so many Imperial contracts, I wouldn't be surprised if they used some of the same, simpler tech. Obviously not the high-tech, military-only devices, but many of the internals from electrical and comms might be not too far off from civilian versions. He may now have a pretext to travel to Fondor for ship parts and maintenance, which would be just another layer of plausible cover to let him steal Imperial technology or slice into their comms. At the very least, he could keep eyes and ears on changes in Imperial ship production. The first thing we see is one of the most unique, customized upgrades of any ship out there. A whistle. Analog sound, not some digital code used to unlock the ship. Extending the legs, dropping the ramp, and spreading the wings to prepare for flight. The whistle is an homage to Star Wars being a space western, the rugged old cowboy calling for his horse, and the wing design may be a reference to the TIE Striker, which was introduced in Rogue One, like Cassian himself. Note Andor's reaction when he runs into the Hullcraft. He is shocked at the luxury finishes and specialized equipment. And when he sees it take off, he knows that Luthen, like this ship, is hiding something under this rugged exterior. What's powering this? I've been in a Fondor Hallcraft. I've flown them. Never seen one do that. To the sleeper car point, Andor just ran up the ramp of a U-Haul, sees a Rolls-Royce interior, and feels it take off like a Ferrari. The attention to detail here is amazing, even as the windows are all scuffed and blemished. I love that a cockpit with this much tech in it has these windows, and that the rear window looks all beat up too. It's the opposite of guys that put dark tent on a Hellcat and wonder why it looks so suspicious. Imps like Tarkin were known to have an eye for the oddest little thing out of place. There are stories of him catching his underlings in a lie just because of some small stain on a uniform that matched up with some incident involving a rare chemical. So not having these windows all scuffed up too would have been a huge red flag. The cockpit itself is similar to a Corellian design, but not exactly. With this same sleeper ship concept being behind the Millennium Falcon, the fastest ship in the galaxy is a commercial-grade light freighter, a really popular model within the ubiquitous YT series. This simple loading ramp was fine for cargo, and even driving up the small speeder, which must have gone straight into this space, as you see them run off down the corridor to the left. There's a match back. Blue, bright blue. This is such a tangent, but I loved it. On Earth, red is the color of wound treatment, from medics in the military to first aid boxes in the bathroom. So I think in the galaxy far, far away, it's blue, because Bacta and Colto before it came to symbolize the color of healing. We later hear him say this. Your controls, landing protocol 037. Protocol 037. Putting him on course for his shop, the galactic antiquities and objects of interests. This protocol opens up hidden drawers for his public persona as a sophisticated art dealer. And since when he says Protocol 37, it's Alex Coruscant on this map, I counted all the dots and there's 72 of them, so perhaps Luthen has 72 safe spots all around the galaxy. What's really interesting is that some of these get into wild space, and even the unknown regions. This AI, only known as the Fondor Droid Mod, also acted like ship security, keeping an eye on Andor as the man considered stealing the ship and running away. And in his Coruscant shop, we see that Luthen and this woman are masters at encrypted long-range comms, keeping in touch with events all across the galaxy. And this Hallcraft has the same ability to check in from even the most remote sectors in space. To communicate this fast is actually faster than light, and requires similar tech to a hyperdrive. 
called a hyperwave relay, and the ship's array was connected to this AI, allowing it to slice into, or at least access, previously stolen lists, getting them a legit Alderaan ID. I need an active transponder ID. Preference Alderaan. Yes, this is Alderaan 129-12505. ID confirmed, sir. Alderaan Trade Alliance. Something that likely required this to be pulled off a sort of blockchain tech, like we saw being implemented with the chain codes. And this AI can also identify ships, as well as finer detail like the power level of the Cantwell's tractor beam. If you look at these screens, we see info from targeting computers right above the yoke, with what appears to be AI support, pay-to-win aimbot upgrades, a video screen instead of holographic display, the status of the countermeasures over here, and the ship hull integrity and engine status displayed on this screen. While on the left are monitors showing the path through space, how that nav computer slices up space into 2D grid panels, and picks a square to go through, as well as a larger scale display showing nearby orbitals and their paths. He mentions stealth capabilities, Prepare for evac, full stealth. But this isn't actual visible cloaking tech like the infiltrator or carrion spike. Instead, it's more like a stealth bomber, making use of sensor jamming tech that made it invisible to almost all sensors. And what I thought of is a bit of speculation, but it may even include manipulations of its gravitational presence with small tractor beams. I've never really heard of this in any other ship, but why couldn't a tractor beam work to smooth out or widen the ship's warping of space-time, making a gravity imprint that wouldn't look like a ship at all, and or use these tractors to create a strange gravity wave presence that would lead any Imperial tech to think that the sensors were just glitching, or surely this was just some odd astronomical phenomena. We see how perfectly Luthen uses his ship as an extension of himself. Having a calm demeanor with the imps, plausible excuses like this janky old ship's autopilot engaging the thrusters as a security measure, seeing the gravitational pull of the tractor beams as it coming dangerously close to some large object, and the amazing irony that everyone would believe a hull craft like this would require cumbersome manual controls to override this when he actually has one of the most useful AI systems. But when he can tell that the imp is set on detaining him, maybe even picking up on the comms in the Cantwell that a boarding party was being scrambled, he knew that if he was boarded, these imps would have the same reaction and or did. Realizing it was a stealth conversion, with top-of-the-line comm systems, weapon systems, and navigational gear that a simple hauler could only dream of. When he accelerates, we see the ion engines are strong enough to cause the around 400 meter long cruiser to jolt forward. And they're not like the usual round thrusters, but a solid band of ion emitters, like we see in some Sinar craft, like Mole Ship and TIE variants, but it could just be a similar style to the way Corellian engines work too. And though he cannot escape, he assures that the tractor beams keep pulling on him at full force, setting up the counterattack. The weapon systems themselves had to be hidden in recessed areas, like the dual laser cannon turret that pops up on top, to the variable munitions flechette launchers that are hidden behind this area that looks like an unassuming radiator panel for shedding heat. Solid projectile weapons have advantages against some forms of energy shields that better disperse the ionized plasma bolts of standard weaponry, and when he fires these, he knows that the powerful tractor beam is just going to accelerate them right into its dish. This position of such an odd weapon points to the lore on the Cantwell that states that everyone from local police forces to moths were eager to get their hands on this tractor beam cruiser, to the point that it was relatively common at major spaceports, and would almost certainly be found all around Fondor, which is where Luthen may have started to see this new ship and realized that he would need to put in place counter tractor beam weaponry. When the turret pops up, it acquires a target right away, and someone pointed out in the last video that he hits the trooper section of this TIE BR, which could have carried 20 troops before coolly whipping around the gun to take out another tie with some AI support, and then unleashing the most unique weapon of any ship of this era, remembering the wisdom of the greatest pilot in the galaxy. I'll try spinning, that's a good trick! Though there is nothing exactly like it, I thought of the prototype B6 and its composite beam weapon. This thing ripped through an Arquidens, and since this Rebel episode takes place just one year after Andor, it isn't crazy to think that someone like Luthen, seemingly plugged into all sorts of Rebel groups all around the galaxy, and who specializes in odd items, with a pretext to travel wherever he wants, could have come across someone who developed similar tech, if not meeting Quarry himself. Quarry was the Mon Cala engineer of the B6, and the Calamari were one of the first to be oppressed by the Empire. With the invasion of Mon Cal happening just one year into Imperial reign, where Akbar and Radis were able to escape with the fleet, and were from then on out devoted to destroying the Empire. So it is very likely that this is prototype Mon Cal tech. Besides the B6, the closest thing are the beam weapons of the LAAT, which we never see fire for this long, just shorter bursts of a couple seconds, though I imagine it could be made to fire longer. 
Though what sounds crazy at first is that this is some sort of lightsaber tech, specifically a weapon based on kyber crystals. He gives a kyber crystal to Andor for collateral, and although this one isn't exactly like a lightsaber's, given his connections and antiquity shop, which has a wide array of weapons and armor, even Starkiller's suit and a Jedi Temple Guard mask, I think he's one of the most likely people to have come across some lightsabers. Why this also makes sense is that the series ends on this shot of the Death Star being built. Has cameos with Saul, which as much as I love to see him, he wasn't utilized in some big mission or anything. What Saul's appearance puts in your mind is the connection to Urso's family and his passionate hunt to track down the secret superweapon, where he would come across enormous kyber crystals of the type used in the composite beam of the Death Star. So this may be a little hint at some connection. To the point that some of you asked in the comments if he could be a Jedi survivor. Personally, I don't think so. I lean more towards old Clone Wars era spy or intel operative. Like how in the Tarkin novel, his greatest rebel foe was Birch Teller, who previously served as a Republic intelligence officer. Maybe Luther was something like this, or even with Separatist intelligence. Which also adds layers to the space battle. He knows that this fight will draw ISB attention. And sadly, I wouldn't be surprised if he scraps this ship. This might be the last time we see it. But he would have the devious satisfaction that the Empire would waste countless resources stopping one of the most common crafts in the galaxy. A shiver running through the spine of imps as they detain and then board the ship, only to find an annoyed pilot and boxes full of Meluron fruit inside. This is one of the greatest examples of how a ship can be used as a tool to show character development. It is Luthen, trying to be unassuming when it needs to be, but also to whom money isn't an object, along with the skill to deploy these resources expertly. Just how Luthen can change from a grumpy old haggard working class guy to a refined gentleman of the uppermost crust of Coruscant at a moment's notice. This ship can transform in an instant and take advantage of Imperial complacency and overconfidence. But this battle is also showing the increased tension in both Luthen and the galaxy. It is harder and harder to avoid open fights. From the riots on Ferrix, to Andor devoting his life to the Rebellion, Mon Mothma making deals with shady criminals, to Anton Krieger's death, this ship goes from being hidden to bold and open combat, buzzing the bridge of an Imperial cruiser, foreshadowing an open rebellion, as the Rebel Alliance that would plunge the galaxy into a civil war was just a few years away. Thanks for watching, and let's thank our sponsor, Audible. I've been listening to Audible for over a decade, and I can say with full confidence that they have the greatest Star Wars content out there. Tons of Legends books, my favorite are the Bane Trilogy and Revan, and amazing canon books like Dark Disciple, Tarkin, the Canon Thrawn Trilogy, Master and Apprentice, and so many more. In fact, I'd say my favorite canon stories are actually coming from audiobooks, which can get into so much more detail and are true audio experiences, with excellent narration and great background sounds that really help to bring you into the story. I asked Master Yoda about how I was found. Do you know what he told me? No. The Council received a message from my father telling them what I was, instructing them to take me away. What? Perhaps it shouldn't be a surprise, the way he looked at me in the rubble. As you can see, I make heavy use of the notes feature, and you get so much with your Audible Plus membership that it's really becoming the home of storytelling. With Audible originals and podcasts, in every genre from bestsellers to celebrity memoirs to history, business, and wellness. I use Audible almost every day, so let Audible help you discover new ways to laugh, be inspired, or be entertained. New members can try it free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash metanerds or text metanerds to 500-500 to try Audible free for 30 days. Audible.com slash metanerds. Most important of all, remember, if you thought video games were bad, real world weaponry is very much pay to win. And the force will be with you. Always.